Welcome. Can you hear me? I can't tell if the mic is good. Okay. Um, my name is Christina Cogdell, and I'm the current chair of the Department of Design. I'm so happy to be here today to introduce the Carlos and Andrea Alberini Family Lecture Series in Design. Today's talk, as you can see, is titled Building Power, Designing for Democracy by Damon Rich and Rostin Wu. Last year, the Alberini family endowed this speaker series to allow us to bring internationally known designers here to UC Davis to present their work. This is a fantastic way to elevate the national stature of our program by exposing our students to excellence in real world design practice and allowing them to meet and interact with these designers. Beyond tonight's lecture, students will have time with both of our speakers tomorrow. This type of experience offers them stepping stones uh, for after their degrees to forge meaningful paths using their design skills and insights. We are so grateful to the Alberini family for their foresight and generosity in establishing this series, which we consider a hallmark of our program. None of the Alberini family is able to be with us today, but we extend our warmest thanks to them through the video that's being made here right now. The Department of Design at UC Davis is the only comprehensive design department within the UC system, with exceptional access for interdisciplinary research, owing to collaborative possibilities with faculty and students in other programs across the humanities, social sciences, and sciences. Our faculty are deeply committed to research and teaching that promotes design in the service of social justice, sustainability, and human-centered practice. We have extended this flavor to our selection of this year's Alberini speakers. And to this end, it's wonderful to have Damon Rich and Rostin Wu here to share their work using design to promote social equity and democracy in the public interest. The discipline of design as an academic field arose in the 20th century, with most designers being employed by corporations for product styling, branding, and marketing. In the last decades of the 20th century, public interest design arose as a citizen-focused alternative. It is in this field that Rich's and Wu's work excels. In the late 1990s, Rich founded the nonprofit Center for Urban Pedagogy, which everyone calls CUP, uh, in New York City, with seven co-founders, including Wu and Althea Wasso, both of whom are here today. In 2016, uh, long after uh, the founders originally started it, CUP was the winner of the National Design Award for Institutional Achievement. So it is an organization that is alive and well and going strong. Last May, Carlos Alberini, who is the CEO of Lucky Brand, and Kin Ying Li, Lucky's Chief Creative Officer, initiated the Endowed Series with an overview of their branding experiences. This lecture was co-sponsored by UCD's Graduate School of Management. And it was a great start for this series that so far seems to want to cross disciplinary borders. This year, Rich and Wu's inaugural talk aligns closely with the interests of Imagining America and the landscape architecture and community re regional development programs. And I want to thank the faculty and students of these programs for helping us promote this year's lecture and for being present here today. I will also briefly mention that next year, our speaker will be Jenny Sabin director of the Sabin Design Lab at Cornell University uh, in their Department of Architecture. Her expertise in architectiles, she does complex weavings on an architectural scale, uh, and biology has won her many awards, most recently selection in 2017 as the winner of New York City's Museum of Modern Art's Young Architects Program. To introduce our speakers today, I begin with Damon Rich a 2017 recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Genius Award, who is partner at Hector, an urban design and civic arts practice. Hector's recent projects include designing a riverfront park, writing citywide zoning and land use regulations, and creating a memorial for eco-feminist Sister Carol Johnson. In public spaces, exhibitions, graphic works, and events, often produced in collaboration with young people and community-based organizations, Rich creates fantastical spaces for imagining the transformation of the world. His work has been exhibited at venues including the Museum of Modern Art, Netherlands Architecture Institute, the U.S. Pavilion at the 11th International Architecture Exhibition in Venice. 
Rich and his projects have been recognized by the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the American Planning Association National Planning Award, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the Loeb Fellowship in Advanced Environmental Studies, the McDowell Colony Fellowship, and the MIT Center for Advanced Visual Studies. Rich has taught design, architecture, and planning at schools including Harvard University, Barnard College, Cooper Union, and Syracuse University. And he's written about architecture and real estate for Perspecta, Domas, and The Village Voice. He previously served as planning director and chief urban designer for Newark, New Jersey, and chief of staff for capital projects for New York City Parks. Our second speaker, Rostin Wu, is co-founder of CUP and served as executive director there after Rich stepped down. Wu is an artist, designer, and writer living in Los Angeles. His projects aim to help people understand complex systems, reorient themselves to places, and participate in group decision making. He acts as a collaborator and consultant to a variety of grassroots organizations, including Little Tokyo Service Center, Black Workers Center, Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, and Esperanza Community Housing Corporation, as well as the LA Philharmonic, City of Los Angeles, and California State Parks. His work has been exhibited at the Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial, the Venice Biennale, and various piers, public housing developments, shopping malls, and parks. His, street, his, excuse me, his book, Street Value, about race and retail urban development was published by Princeton Architectural Press in 2009. Finally, I introduce Althea Wasso, a co-founder and original member of the board of directors of CUP during the organization's first decade. From the late 1990s, she was a humanities and English teacher at an inclusion-modeled public high school in central Harlem that integrated art and social justice across the curriculum. It was then that she became familiar with Rich's early collaborations and began sharing his vision of a nonprofit organization to create educational projects about places and how they change. Rich invited her to work with him and other future co-founders, most importantly Wu, uh, to build the Center for Urban Pedagogy. While serving on CUP's board of directors and finally as vice chair before moving to the Bay Area, she's now the most local member who will be here with us today, uh, Wasso contributed to identifying and shaping the key domains of CUP's impact, community education, youth education, and public programming. She helped the organization grapple with the politics and power dynamics of collaboration. And she prioritized effective fundraising to support the organization's growth and capacity building. Currently, she's pursuing her PhD in film and media and critical theory at UC Berkeley. And she's co-curator with The Future of Public, a nonprofit initiative that seeks to increase understanding of the consequences of privatization and develop strategies to re reclaim the commons. Welcome to Damon, Rostin, and Althea. Hello. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, it, for, uh, for me, in particular, it feels a little bit like a West Coast cup reunion because it's the first time that Damon, Rostin, and I have been back together. And thank you to... UC Davis for making that possible. Um, I also specifically want to thank Damon Rostin and Christina for inviting me to include some reflections as a co-founder of CUP in today's event. In the following few minutes, I would like to do two things. First, I would like to take you back for a moment to New York City in the late, 90, in the late 90s and early 2000s when a group of recent, very recent college graduates was grappling with what CUP's mission and core values should be and what steps would help us achieve our goals most effectively. Then I would like to share a brief schematic introduction to CUP's early years to set, up, to set you up for more in-depth discussion by Rostin and Damon. In February 1999, Damon invited me to a proto, pre, pre but yet it still existed, um, cup project at Cooper Union called Governor's Island Points of Interest. And then I'll quote from the index card invitation, pre Facebook and everything, um, an in investigation into the built environment. I vividly remember attending this exhibition it struck me for several reasons. Most importantly, as an inclusion teacher working 
in an integrated ninth grade classroom with students with learning differences and learning disabilities and so-called mainstream students, I was passionate about modes of learning, experience, and knowledge production that engaged multiple senses and encouraged participation. I actually have a whole little section here on why that exhibit was so powerful for me, but I'm gonna skip that and save time so you can hear directly from Damon and Rostin about the specific works. Um, later that spring, Damon came to an exhibition of my students' collages about neighborhood change in Harlem at the city of the Museum of New York. He asked me if I would be interested in serving on the board of a yet to be formally created organization. I was and am so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with others to shape CUP and that CUP shaped me. What stands out to me still to this day about CUP's practice that was clear even at that first proto-CUP exhibit was CUP's commitment to using the power of art and design in highly innovative ways to work to create inclusive communities, breaking down the division between the culture of experts and everyday life, and engaging the politics of collaboration beyond just invoking collaboration without really struggling to figure out how that works. From that first show, I was motivated by our mutual interest um, in recognizing that students and community residents themselves have valuable, essential knowledge and expertise. I'm gonna shift to a little more background on CUP beyond my first encounter. CUP was founded in New York City to create, quote, and this is an early phrasing of it, educational projects about places and how they change, end quote. Um, through workshops, school programs, exhibitions, and publications. Founder Damon Rich convened co-founders, including Rostin Wu and myself, to launch an organization capable of sustained work to increase participation in decision-making about the shaping of urban space and everyday life. The group of co-founders brought varied backgrounds and shared passion to the tasks of identifying the organization's core mission and goals, structuring its board of directors, obtaining financial support, and creating CUP's first projects. From its beginning in the late 1990s, CUP developed educational and design methods to communicate about complex issues through publications, public programs, and exhibitions on topics including, and you'll hear more in depth about these in a moment, urban renewal, housing subsidies, public and public housing. CUP also organized school-based programs that used the urban environment as a teaching tool, forging collaborations among students, artists, teachers, organizers, academics, and city planners and workers. In 2001, on the 100th anniversary of New York City's Tenement Housing Act, CUP organized Building Codes, an exhibition at Storefront for Art and Architecture that used multiple methods to investigate and represent the politics of urban development. The following year, CUP conducted its first urban investigation project, Garbage Problems, which involved CUP collaborating with high school students to research waste management and then create posters, models, and a video about what they learned. In 2002, CUP officially received its 501c3 status, and in 2004, Damon and Rostin became the organization's first full-time staff. In that same year, CUP formalized some of the partnerships that became core to CUP's practice, hiring project-based teaching artists, expanding the circle of collaborators, and increasing our impact. CUP also formally partnered, partnered with a community-based organization for the first time, public housing residents of the Lower East Side. Um, it is important to note the instrumental role Rostin played in, among other things, strengthening CUP's relationship with other nonprofit organizations. In 2007, with the introduction of Making Policy Public, 
a poster series that aims to make policy issues truly public by connecting designers with advocacy organizations, CUP began to create more structured, collaborative frameworks for advocacy organizations, designers, and CUP staff. In its first decade, CUP wanted to take the core methods developed in projects such as the Building Codes exhibit, stake, and this is even in the proto exhibit, um, Governor's Island points of interest, these were methods used. Stakeholder interviews, collaborations with students, organizers, advocates, educators, and visual artists, and the use of engaging visuals to break down and communicate complex policy and planning issues and developed a series of programs to meet specific community needs. Um, as CUP's programs evolved, the organization continued to use print, video, and other media to create visually-based projects that help communities all over New York City and beyond understand and participate in the decision-making that shapes their communities. It's a testament to Damon and Rostin and including myself, the other co-founders, that after the original group has left, the organization continues to thrive brilliantly under the leadership of Christine Gaspar. Um, it's a true pleasure um, to welcome Damon and Rostin. I'll tell you just briefly their um, presentation. They're gonna go back and forth and present together. So Rostin will begin sharing a cup project Damon will share a cup broad project, and then they'll both um, share more recent uh, current work, and there'll be time for questions at the end. Thank you so much for coming, and please join me in welcoming Damon and Rostin. Hi, um, can people hear me? Yes, yes, louder. Um, okay, I'll talk as I'll talk as loud as um, now. Can people hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, great. So my name is Ross Wu. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Cup's work and my own work, mostly through the lens of two different things that I think design can do um, in the realm of kind of political engagement. And I came to CUP and I came to design, really, through an interest in politics and an interest in community organizing and thinking, how do you shift power um, in conflicts around, uh, around urban space and around land use? Um, so that's always kind of the frame that I kind of come, came to this work with. Um, I now have a lot of other avenues which I'm interested in design, but that was really like how I initially conceived of it, is design as a tool. Um, so this first strategy I'm going to talk about is about how do you make things legible in order to make things more equitable. Um, not just making things more legible for the sake of making them legible, um, but as a way to shift um, what I would sort of think of as information asymmetry that goes on um, often in, kind of in conflict. Um, where one party, um, in, in, often in land use issues, um, there's one party who has, a, even though everyone is governed under the same body of law, one party has a vaster knowledge of it, vaster command of it, and therefore has this kind of default position of being able to sort of set the terms of engagement, set the rules. So some of these projects, I'm going to show two projects um, from 2009, sort of, I don't know, that's earlier, mid-period mid cup, um, that are about trying to intervene in that very specific situation. I also think of these as kind of uh, short horizon projects. I, I, I kind of divide my work into short and long horizon things. Things that can be done um, that will make kind of an immediate difference in a very specific local struggle, and things that are kind of more about changing the cultural horizon of what's, what's possible and how we think about what the future could be. Um, so this project uh, I'm going to show first is called Vendor Power, and it's in some ways kind of like, it's like the most direct possible uh, interpretation of, of what I just said. Um, so if you read this, um, this is from the Administrative Code Governing Street Vending in New York City. Um, it says here, food vendors shall be prohibited from vending on the following streets at the following days and times. Borough of Manhattan, 3rd Avenue, East 40th to East 57th Street, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. East 58th, I'm not going to read the whole thing. You get the idea. Um, so even for someone who is a fluent uh, speaker of English, someone who has a legal training, someone who has a lot of time on their hands, it would still be kind of a lift to even understand where you are or aren't allowed to vent. Um, and street vending um, is a very popular way to make a living in New York City. It's in some ways kind of widely beloved, but it's also a, a field of, um, 
of commerce that is really, really poorly regulated, I would say, and also very unevenly policed. Um, so you often see situations where vendors are asked to move, um, and it's not necessarily because they're doing anything wrong, but it's because a store owner who's like a bricks and mortar store owner is like, why is this person outside being able to sell hats and scarves when I have to pay rent and I'm selling hats and scarves? I'll just ask the police officer to get these people out and sort of tell them, like, you can't be here. And if you're a vendor, you don't really know if you can be there or not very often. Um, and in that situation, given that the way that the fees are structured, you know, five fees, that's thousands of dollars, you're probably out of the game entirely if you, if you are, you know, pushed away five times. So people are often just sort of at this, at a loss, like, okay, I'll just move away. So this project was organized, um, it's a wonderful collaboration between a lot of really talented people. A designer named Candy Chang worked on it, uh, a lawyer named John Mangin, who was at CUP uh, under a fellowship from his law school, and, um, and the, an organization called the Street Vendor Project, which is a constituent, member-driven organization um, started by a street vendor who became a lawyer, organized under the Urban Justice Center. So we worked together as a team to produce this, um, this document. Um, so taking things like this and turning them into something like this. Um, and so you can see it sort of translates that um, jargon, which is typically spread across three different kinds of administrative code, um, and boils it down to what is most important and something that you really don't need to have any particular grasp of a language even um, to get, um, but also is translated into five languages. Um, and helps people understand sort of like, well, here's how far I have to be from a door, here's how far I have to be from the curb, here's where my stuff can be, here's where it can't be, all those sorts of things. And it's designed not just to be a, um, you know, kind of a know your rights training, like it's, it's good for you to happen to know this information, but as a tool that's used in a very specific interaction. So it folds out um, kind of from, from, from this view um, to this, and you kind of get increasing layers of information. So as you're interacting with a police officer or a store owner who's telling you you have to move, um, you're able to kind of look at this and refer to this very kind of like professional looking document to kind of assert your right to be there. And so the idea is that that kind of leveling of information actually can kind of fundamentally change the dynamic of that engagement um, and change the, you know, the, both the number and the way in which street vendors are harassed in their, their homes. Um, the other thing that it does is as you fold it out, um, it kind of becomes a poster. And this poster is something that you can put on the wall. We sort of designed this face with the idea of it being kind of for vending fans. Um, there's lots of people who are like fans of street food in this sort of general, general sense. Um, but we're sort of like how can you kind of convert like a vending fan into a vending advocate? So people might actually understand what is the legal framework that governs them? What are the types of vendors? What's the problem with the way that the licenses and the fees are organized? What's the kind of frontier of what vendors might need to have a more sustainable and, uh, and fruitful, fruitful life in the city? And so this document, um, it also it tells stories about, about specific street vendors, so people have a sense of kind of different vendors and what they do, how they kind of got to the situation, and what they sell. Um, and we distributed 10,000 of these uh, throughout New York City with the help of the Street Vendor Project. And one kind of like nice uh, outcome of that was that the Department of Consumer Affairs then decided after we'd done it already, like, oh, actually this is really useful, we should actually orient people who apply for licenses to what the, the, the laws are. Um, and they printed another 10,000 um, and started to kind of keep on producing them as part, of, um, as part of their general kind of educational programming. And I think that's a through line that you'll sort of see um, in several of these projects and sort of certainly the way I think about the work I do and I think it's still somewhere in, in CUPS DNA is this idea of if you kind of imagine like what is the benevolent state that I would kind of imagine <laughs> them doing? If I just do that, um, maybe at some point that becomes kind of picked up um, as, as an activity that, that the state will actually endorse. Um, and that's sort of like, instead of kind of like waiting for, advocating for someone else to kind of produce these things, can you kind of just leap forward and make them yourselves and kind of lead, lead through kind of, uh, I guess I could say example or, or, or doing. So this, is, this project it became part of a larger project called Making Policy Public that uh, Althea mentioned. Um, essentially, it was a, a way that we kind of at CUP decided how can we figure out how to kind of harness this kind of excess of interest in CUP at that time where it's like we're just a few people, a lot of organizations seem to want to work with us, a lot of friends who are designers want to work with us, but we don't want to have to like tell friends they can't work on things and we don't want to tell, you know, <laughs> how can we actually sort of with a very small staff kind of expand the impact and the thought was that well, we can kind of design some sort of competition that hopefully will not be like an irritating design competition but, um, <laughs> but, but an actual way to harness real, real effort and goodwill. And I think that's sort of a theme in a lot of CUP's work is how do you kind of create a project that balances incentives between different kinds of people who all want to work on something for different reasons. 
So basically the way it works is uh, organizations submit briefs of like, here's a problem that is difficult for us to explain to our constituents. And then designers send in very, very small, sh simple portfolios, like 10, 10 projects. Um, and then a single jury meets twice to, one, pick uh, four really good problems and four really interesting designers. And then we basically match make and manage that collaboration until we produce publications. So we've done, um, there was, I think we produced about six or seven of them by the time I left. And now there's, I think, 30 of them. Um, it keeps on going. There's about four a year. So topics ranging from, like, how does the logistics system of um, cargo work and how do longshoremen fit into that to how do uh, ex-offenders who are leaving incarceration um, navigate the job system to all kinds of all kinds of topics. So these are examples of, of ways that you can use design to, I'd say, sort of like even out those information asymmetries and change the way that conversations happen. Um, this next project is like a little bit wonkier and deeper into that that sphere, um, and is very near and dear to my heart. I was worked in affordable housing development before I started working with CUP, um, and it, this project sort of came out of this idea of. Uh, I'd been to a lot of community board meetings where the conversation would just absolutely devolve um, once someone started talking about affordable housing. Someone who was trying to build affordable housing or they didn't want affordable housing. And um, regardless of where you were on the political spectrum, people just had an enormous distrust about what was being talked about. So some people would be like, oh, affordable housing, that's just like you're trying to bring drug addicts in here. That's what that is. Other people, would, housing advocates would come in and say, oh, affordable housing, that will never be affordable to anyone I know. This is a scam. Don't, don't believe it. These developers are crooks. And the city would often come in and say, like, listen, it's a really complicated federal policy. None of you could understand it, really, so just trust us. This is the best deal you could ever have. 20 units is it. You know, be happy. And it just sort of felt very infantilizing the way this discussion um, was conducted. And I sort of thought, well, if, you, if we gave people a chance to be clear about what they're talking about, would they take it? Could you, could you actually set up a framework so that people, when they're proposing affordable housing or talking about it, they can talk about something very concrete instead of sort of like an abstract boogeyman called affordable housing. So this project is very straightforwardly titled, What is Affordable Housing? And it has a couple different components, but I sort of fundamentally think of it as a workshop, um, as, as a place where people have a conversation. Um, so there's a book, there's a website, um, and there's a big giant felt chart. Um, so uh, this is the, the felt chart. Um, so the book, and it's also kind of an associated power presenta PowerPoint presentation. Um, there's actually editions now in Chicago, and there's a Chinese version, um, Spanish version. Explains sort of the basics of kind of what do we mean by affordable housing in the context of kind of federally subsidized housing. So when we're talking about affordable housing, what is the federal government meaning? Um, and typically, just I have to do a really quick primer on this to even make the project make sense. Um, what they mean is it's housing that costs 30% of your income or less. Um, if you can afford that, um, it means that you're paying 30% of your income or less on your housing. You can afford it if you're doing that. If you are, hats off to you. Um, of course, you know, that is very different depending on what your actual income is. If you're making a million dollars a year, you can afford to be spending $300,000 on housing. Um, if you're making you know, 10000 it's a very different number. So what that ends up being targeted by, by region using something called area median income or median family income. And so what this project at its heart is, is kind of this one visual tool. So you can sort of see here, on the top you have incomes going from 20K to 180K. And on the bottom you have sort of the translation of like what that means in terms of your housing costs burden per month. You know, so you know, divide 100K by 12, multiply that times 0.3, you get 2,500. So a person who's making $100,000 a year can afford to spend that much money on rent. Is that feel following? <laughs> All right. So it does that kind of simple math for you, so it's just visual and laid out. Um, it pegs everything based on this MFI, and a lot of people are shocked just from the outset, like, oh, the median income here in New York is almost $80,000. It's probably even higher now. This is probably you know, from 2009. Um, but it's because it you know, includes all of the suburbs of, you know, it's, it's the metro area. So everything is kind of shifted in, in that sense um, of all, what everything, all the percentages are targeted off of. So when we talk about different kinds of um, housing, typically they're bracketed off as percentages of that, of the AMI or the MFI. So there's extremely low income housing is the yellow, the red band is low income one, darker red band is low income two, and so on and so forth up into high income. So it kind of gives you a, a kind of uh, a scale in which you'd be talking about housing at all. Um, and then using census data, people in the workshop will kind of populate that with sort of like, here's how many households we know are making this much. Here's how many are making this much, this much, this much, this much, this much. Um, and then you have kind of a quick income map of your neighborhood. 
And you can sort of say, okay, well, this is Juanes, where Cup's office is. Here's the Upper East Side. Here's Chinatown. Um, and you can see that there's really big differences in, in neighborhoods. Then you can have sort of a conversation about, well, what is rent actually here? Um, you can throw up, uh, you know, a one-bedroom apartment costs this much, and you sort of have a conversation in the group of like, you know, I think it's around here. Um, come up with a number people are, are comfortable with, add in two-bedroom, three-bedroom. And now you kind of have the beginning of an analysis, right? So you can start thinking about, well, okay, so if in this neighborhood, a two-bedroom apartment is almost $2,000, but almost everyone in this neighborhood is making, you know, can't afford that, what does that mean? You know, and that's a conversation that can go in a lot of different directions. You could be talking about, well, maybe that's because of rent control, or maybe that's because people are doubling up in apartments, or maybe that's because no one can afford to be here and they're spending way more than that on rent. But you kind of have this like platform, at least we're all talking about the same thing and we know what these numbers are. Um, then you can add on things like, here's the actual existing public housing programs or uh, subsidized housing programs and choose who they serve. Um, so you can actually look at that. And a lot of people are immediately surprised if they don't you know, work with public housing or live in public housing. They're like, oh, I didn't realize that you could be making like, you know, $63,000 and qualify for public housing. Like, there's a lot of people, it's a murky field. Even though people are fundamentally obsessed with it right now, especially in California, everyone's talking about how do we get out of this housing crisis. Many people, you know, like people who are the most adamant, you know, advocates of a position or another, often don't really have any sense of what that landscape really, really looks like. Um, and so this is a tool for having that conversation. So you could potentially get, you know, a, a renting, uh, you know, rent control advocacy group in, in the same room with a, a YIMB group, and they could actually at least have some sort of common frame for continuing that discussion, is the idea. Um, then you can actually take it to having a very specific conversation about like, okay, here's a development. We're gonna build, you know, 40 units of this, 10 units of that, how does that sound? What's possible? And the idea is that once you kind of have mapped that out, it just sets the stage so that you can't really have a conversation anymore that's about no one knows what affordable housing means, this isn't affordable to anyone. You actually do know, and there's a, a kind of, it's, it's kind of publicly recorded on, that, on the wall of the room. And so that's a project that um, also, there's an also an online component. Um, it's designed to be, um, to be used, and it's used in these specific kind of situations throughout New York City. So we have 100 of these kits moving around, um, every community board has one. Uh, a ton of different kind of rent control advocates have them. Um, youth, youth development programs have them. And it's sort of used in this kind of flexible way where you can start, use it to start a conversation that's about gentrification. You can use it to talk about a really specific affordable housing development you want to build. Um, and, and this is part of a larger project that CUP is still continuing to this day. Um, unpacking different aspects of development. So there's a kit that's about zoning. There's a kit that was just released um, about ULERP, um, the Uniform Land Use Review Process, sort of equivalent to like an environmental impact review here in, um, in California. But helping people who are kind of otherwise sort of asked to participate in these public forums, but not really given any of the tools to really meaningfully participate, um, be part of those conversations is the, is the concept of it. So I'm gonna leave this project here um, turn it over to Damon, and then um, I'll, be, I'll be back to talk about a different kind of approach in one second. So I'm also really uh, happy to be here, um, especially with Althea and Rawson, who I've known for a combined total of 40 years. Um, you know, thanks to uh, Professor Cogdell, it's also really um, interesting to be here to address uh, one of the only comprehensive design departments in the, in the UC system. So, uh, Anyway, and I also, probably obvious from the beginning, um, am interested to talk about how we as designers might even make some c modest contributions to practices of democracy. So anybody here from the suburbs? All right, me too. Um, I grew up in a place called Creve Coeur, which means Broken Heart, Missouri. Um, downtown St. Louis is down here, and this is where I'm from, almost up against the Missouri River. And along with many advantages from growing up there, today I'm acutely aware of disabilities, or maybe better said, sanctioned ignorance that growing up there fostered. Despite excellent schools and teachers, um, you know, I really had no clue and no way to begin understanding many things that are important if you're an architect or a designer or an urban planner. Things like the forces that created the American segregated suburbs. So when I was growing up there in the 80s, over 90% of the residents when the census came marked white. 
And when my friends and I uh, found some trouble hanging out in 7-Eleven parking lots or getting curfew tickets trespassing across golf courses, we thought it was because the suburbs were made by boring adults, not because it was the result of the exercise of power and violence on the landscape. Maybe not like the fast violence, like getting punched or cut, but a more complex and dispersed brutality. And so coming from this background, it was an extra dose of strangeness to study architecture, which I love, but which has also for now for hundreds of years been obsessed with proving its own legitimacy, usually by proclaiming its own elite taste or mystical knowledge about buildings that no one else has. Um, so this didn't much help, you know, help my sanctioned ignorance about what had shaped the world around me and probably made me even worse. My first job out of college was with the New York City Parks Department. Um, and this really began to show me different ways that, intera that design interacts with politics, not always providing solutions or happy compromises, but in marshalling objects, buildings, and landscapes in broader conflicts. So for example, there was a park kind of like this in Queens that had four softball fields laid out like this. So you could have four games at one time. Now, during uh, when I was working there in the late 1990s, there were more people moving in the neighborhood who really liked to play soccer, many of them from Latin backgrounds. The soccer players, understandably, had seen this big green space in the middle of this park and started using it for soccer, sometimes having little skirmishes with the softball players. So one day at the parks department, a group of softball players shows up with their Italian American council member saying, they have the design solution for all of these parks' problems. Voila. The simple metal tubes and chain link of softball backstops becomes a weapon in the shared spaces of the city. It was a very humbling experience as a young designer to see landscape architects that I respected carry out this plan while muttering under their breath uh, it, and, and calling it the metal in the middle. And for me, it was a really early lesson in how design is always involved with cover stories. And part of doing accountable design is learning how to critically navigate those. So this seemingly simple realization that both my suburban upbringing and my education in architecture had maybe done more to insulate me from thinking about these intense moments where design, desire, power, and identity come together, this was really supported and encouraged when I learned about the great American tradition that, that uh, you can call popular education, which here is represented by Septima Clark. Anybody heard about Septima Clark? You should look her up, all right. Um, and she's shown at a citizenship school that she helped establish in the 1950s, where like popular educators everywhere, the practice of education centers people and their lifetime of experiences to build shared understanding, making meaning together, and always tying it to questions of power and action, focusing, like Rostin was describing, more on making relationships, maybe, than communicating information. For me, an understanding of popular education was critical to counterbalancing the way I had mainly learned about architecture. And at the same time, it seemed that maybe some of design's traditions, looking closely at how things are made, using drawings and models to manifest agendas and desires, maybe these things had something to offer the tradition of popular education. So I was lucky early on to have chances to work for organizations that put me with little oversight into classrooms. I'm not sure what they were thinking. Um, but I got to take on projects where we would say, examine carefully the blocks around the school and then draw maps with the most important things labeled. You can see here in the corner, pine cones. <laughs> um, and making models uh, where afterwards, and I think this is one of the first times Rostin and I worked together in a classroom, we distribute capes and masks and hats and different groups of students would represent the design agendas of the police, kids, parents, gangsters, environmentalists, and more. And they'd all lobby the mayor to change the city the way that they wanted. We called it the urban planning smackdown. <laughs> so the throwback cup the Throwback Cup project that I'd like to present comes out of these early days of trying to find ways to collaborate with young people, looking closely at how the world is put together, and understanding how decisions get made about it, to try to apply some of the understandings from popular education to a way of using design to learn. 
Um, nearly all of these projects began with seemingly simple questions, followed by investigations where a group of collaborating designers, artists, and young people play the role of the democratic public, followed by making and sharing things to communicate what we learned. So this project, like most of my favorites, gave me the chance to work with other designers, a filmmaker named Andrea Meller, policy advocates, organizers, government people, and maybe most importantly, teenagers. I have come to see adults, really, as deficient teenagers, or maybe as teens on autopilot. Um, so many of the things that teens are endlessly focused on, inequality, identity, power, clout, we adults have mostly come to ignore or to treat lightly with euphemisms. So in 2002, the starting question for the project was an epic collective one that New York City as a whole was facing, which was what to do with the garbage. The new mayor at the time, rewarding a solid block of his voters who live near the city's only landfill, pledged to close it before working out what exactly to do with the garbage. So with lots of official will to close the landfill, but no real plan on how to replace it, there was lots of anxiety to make sure that a different future for the landfill seemed as real and inevitable as possible to give the closing of this critical facility a legitimating narrative. To help tell that story, institutions and government invited in lots of artists and designers to make exhibitions, to enter competitions, to create an immense park where the landfill had been. Now, while provocative, the effect of these images produced by our colleagues here often seem to be covering over rather than digging into the most interesting parts of the story that not only touched the landfill, but questions about how the whole city approached decisions that it had to make together, like what to do with the garbage. So with that hunch and a connection to an amazing teacher named Andre Knights and an alternative public high school called City S School, we proposed a semester-long investigation and popular education project on garbage. So this was 16 years ago. We laid out a curriculum mixing reading, discussions, site visits, interviews, drawing, modeling, video making. We quickly realized that we were not just up the incredible up against the incredible complexity of the city's garbage system, but that our younger collaborators were wise to and sick of the, the moralizing garbage plansplaining that they had received throughout their lives, like this poster from a New York City subway. One student I remember said, listen, I understand you have to, be, you have to recycle to be a moral person, but sometimes the world isn't so easy. These campaigns made the story of garbage more about individual wholesomeness and choices, not about collective decision making about basic life support. And cartoons like this one with the talking garbage bins made the garbage problem seem more like a technical system that can work out fine as long as the people remember which bin is which. So as educators, we had to find ways to reframe the question by looking at a broader chunk of history and why people had come up with a coordinated garbage system in the first place. We visited the physical locations of garbage infrastructure, like this waste transfer station, located like a huge portion of these in New York City in the South Bronx, a working class community of color. We talked to entrepreneurs, government officials, scientists, corporate pitchmen and policy advocates, like this visit to the Organization of Waterfront Neighborhoods, which was working against the environmental injustice of concentrating garbage facilities in terms of, among other factors, their public health impacts, like really bad respiratory problems. Um, this is also the place where we learned about this large set of binders with a very funny name. It's officially called the city's Solid Waste Action Management Plan, so everyone just calls it the swamp. And so these interviews, which were videotaped, sketched, recorded, helped us understand the organizational environment around garbage, where different interests made allies, blocked their enemies, spread information and disinformation, and more. And we made this drawing that I learned community organizers often call a power map. Rostin has a really great fold-out piece on one version of that. We collected everything we could. Uh, we examined how different groups communicated and what their implied audiences were from the city sanitation department to groups working to change how the city deals and locates garbage infrastructure. And then we brought everything we collected back to the lab uh, to break it down and to try to make things to communicate what we learned as a modest contribution to the city's ongoing garbage debates. 
Now, the work was not always straightforward and sometimes required awkward discussions. For example, when students, thinking about why garbage facilities are where they are, had become focused on this phrase, cheap industrial land, which one interviewee had used. Some of the students had decided that the guy was using this phrase as a euphemism, as a cover story, as a substitute for saying ghetto. Some of the tensions in the group itself became articulated around this discussion. So like when a young man whose parents had immigrated from Mexico said it made sense to the him why they wouldn't want to put it in a Jewish neighborhood because those people would complain too much and they would put it in a black neighborhood instead. So several of the African American students in the group felt a way about him saying that and although it was difficult for us as not so experienced teachers to manage the tension of these very real discussions, these were also the most effective moments of mutual education, older people and younger people, where for a minute at least, we broke through the moralizing educational background about recycling um, in order to have a real discussion about how we design our society. The work was then to find ways to manifest the group's investigation and insights through making things, while some early experiments in information design were not much more than crude drawings with factoids written on top. Students like, Sam, like Francisco, whose father was the building super where they lived and who assigned taking out the garbage to Francisco, uh, he was able to trail his garbage by bike and then connect this route to regional and national garbage flows that we learned about through interviews and put it all into this garbage map that he drew with Jason Anderson. A student named Justina worked on making a drawing of who makes decisions about the city's garbage system, starting in the upper left with her idea for showing uh, it as a giant person with the mayor as the head. After several iterations incorporating research on the city's org chart, uh, we drew this uh, picture of the New York City garbage machine, which connected each of us as individuals and our garbage to the shared structures that take it away from us. Collaborating with the students made it really clear the value of twisted humor, uh, being fascinated with grim reapers and mutant creatures. Uh, so this drawing illustrates the technical operations of our two main garbage technologies, the incinerator and the landfill. And in the space in between unfolds uh, stories of some good things that might come from either process, like potentially cheaper electricity or public money from dumping fees with some bad things like high asthma rates and suddenly sinking houses. As a late entry to the city's design competition, we created this vision for Garbage City, which was made from materials that were rescued by the city's Department of Sanitation and leverage design's function to elicit interpretation. Imagining Garbage City opened up whole new ways for the group to process what we had learned. Some students came up with these macabre narratives where all working class black and brown people are exiled to live on the landfill and make their living by digging things out of it, where inhabitants can only bathe in this leachate pond filled with contaminated rainwater that filters through the landfill. We created maps carrying all the Garbage City creation myths, like the Garbage City Mall, the Garbage Macy's, there's a giant air cleaning machine. At the top of the highest hill, one student proposed this somewhat rude sculpture of the mayor who had made the decision to close the landfill. Uh, you can see it modeled there on the left. Um, uh, there was a 30-minute video uh, that Andrea Meller headed up, uh, w which you can see on CUP's website, um, which includes animated pieces like this one on some of the strongest points we heard from our interviews, as well as their voices and environments. Um, this here was some job advice from some garbage corporations to the students. By sharing the complexities that we learned about, we tried to make representations that not only carried important information, but also critical context to create an image of a place shaped by competing agendas on a complex terrain of land, power, laws, and the health of human and other bodies. Once we were done, it was time to take the show on the road where students could share their work with people who had informed it as well as broader, broader audiences moderating panels of adults and calling them on their adult nonsense as needed, and having the pleasure of seeing how things when made in intriguing and useful ways can circulate through many communities of people working on those issues, making a modest contribution back to the social world that created it, from art galleries, to the superintendent's office, to a mobile garbage education system, for me as a practitioner, I can definitely say that this project opened up new ways of collaborating, pursuing questions, using design to dig into a context. 
It led to lifelong beliefs, like every kid at some point in their school should visit where their toilet leads after they flush and meet the people who unclog things when they get stuffed up so they can draw a legitimate map of where their water comes from and where it goes. I believe that every time a city or town builds something public, like a new sidewalk, the process should be an investigation design civics class, documenting how things are and manifesting how they might be, celebrating the quirks of human culture as only young people can. So when my firm, Hector, is hired to design a park, if possible, we always try to include a phase zero where the client community hires teenagers to bring their critical gaze to the systems they will have to engage in order to win, to have these people take a close look at problems in the park, interviewing decision makers, coming to the big kids' table, spreading the word, and making amazing works of design like this drawing that dramatizes the process of building a community coalition where different organizations are ingested into a single body. Or this piece named Park Dreams and Nightmares in tribute to the Meek Mill song, if you know it, uh, bringing the hopes that they had heard about as well as the fears and trying to leverage all of this work to start new conversations and put those things in the room so they could actually be discussed, similar to what Rostin was saying. I'm back. So I'm gonna talk about a second strategy, which I call making things visible to make them valuable. And I'm gonna talk about it through a specific, mostly through one case study, a project I was asked to do a few years ago um, after I had moved to Los Angeles. Um, and it deals with, uh, what I like to call the interpretive layer. This is an idea I got from a guy, Matthew Coolidge, who runs a thing called the Center for Land Use Interpretation. He talks a lot about the interpretive layer and the thickness, relative thickness of it. And then the idea, what I've taken from it, is this idea that you have a landscape, you have an observer, um, but what the observer actually takes from that landscape is often determined well in advance of encountering that landscape. That you bring to a landscape a lot of assumptions and ideas about what you're going to see there. And what you see in a landscape is often what you expect to see, um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So this is a project that I was asked to do by the Los Angeles County Arts Commission. And it was uh, located in a neighborhood called Willowbrook, which is between Watts and Compton. Um, do people know Willowbrook? Does anyone know Willowbrook? Does anyone know Watts or Compton? <laughs> All right, so I've given this presentation in other cities, other countries. Everybody knows Watts and Compton. There's many people within the city and the county of Los Angeles who have never set foot anywhere near Watts or Compton, but they still have a very clear idea of what Watson and Compton are all about because there is global media about specifically these places um, and a very specific idea of what happens there. So things like NWA or Boys in the Hood or Kendrick Lamar are sort of like the, the messengers of Compton to, um, to, to the world. The, the, well, one of the downsides of this artwork um, is that people who work in, in, in Willowbrook, in Watson, in Compton, who don't live there, um, come to those places with a very specific idea of what they're gonna see and what their job is to do there. Um, and those things are really based on, you know, on a pop culture product. So what I was asked to do there was to create a, um, a visioning plan, a uh, creative visioning project. Uh, Willowbrook is uh, an unincorporated piece of LA County. It's, um, it had this kind of well-known hospital that closed and they were about to reopen it. Metro was about to make a reinvestment. There's in general a ton of capital being kind of like newly pumped back into this area and they wanted to do a, some kind of creative visioning project to help the residents guide that investment in some way. And this is at a moment probably at, in 2012, 2013 at sort of like the, the heat of creative placemaking as an idea that was gonna like save communities. If we can just get people to like think creatively about their place and like come up with creative ways to use the space, you know, we'll transform these communities. Um, and so I was asked to kind of produce this kind of creative visioning work, uh, I think based on things like the affordable housing project, like can I, can I run workshops that will allow people to create a, a vision for this place? Um, so, you know, once I actually set foot in Willowbrook, um, the kind of reality of that situation became very clear in a very different way. Um, it was something that I would sort of call planning fatigue was, was really evident there. People were not that interested in engaging in a creative visioning process. Um, so this is a document I found um, in the library about, about Watts. And it starts here, this is a, a, a community plan Watts. So it starts, let's be honest, this is from 19, I think, 69. 
Let's be honest, the last thing the residents of Watts want to see or read about is another plan for this nationally known community. Plans on studies have a way of wearing thin over the years. This brochure is a summary of still another plan. There's no like but in this whole introduction. Like they, <laughs> there's no further description of like, but we're gonna do something different or something else is gonna happen. They're just describing like, yeah, we just came, we did this consulting work, here's another one, throw it on the pile. Um, and this is something that has happened in many communities throughout the United States, but in particular, um, Watts and Compton are a real magnet for these, 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 these kinds of studies. And there's an idea that's pretty old, you know, the idea of being like a, a poverty pimp, like somebody who just comes, um, gets paid to sort of help and work with poor people in some way, doesn't actually have to really produce anything, but you're able to sort of sustain a middle class lifestyle by doing that. And I'd say uh, there's been quite a few um, plans and studies for this neighborhood that fall into that kind of model. Like no one really expects them to go anywhere. They're just sort of a way to kind of like keep the studio going. Um, and in fact, um, the year before I was asked to do this project, Gensler had just done a community vision plan for Willowbrook. And this is sort of part of their vision for it. And you know, you haven't been to Willowbrook, so I can't, you don't know how absurd these renderings are. <laughs> but, you can, <laughs> but you can imagine kind of that this is, this is not a really feasible um, conception of like what Willowbrook would look like, you know, ever, if not anytime, anytime soon. It's completely disconnected to the reality of, of what is in that community. Um, and, you know, I don't want to shit on Gensler in particular or anything like that. I think this is a very common kind of practice, and I, it was done as a pro bono project, and I think the people who did it had a lot of really good um, goodwill towards the community, but they weren't really necessarily able to see the community as a place that was something besides a nest of problems, um, as things that they could come in and try to fix. So the, sort of the whole conceit is sort of like, it's a wellness community, we're gonna like make everyone well, so we're gonna build this bike path that's called the wellness spine, and it undulates throughout the city, and, that, and it connects like all these different places. You know, of course, you know, if you look at this, like implementing this undulating wellness spine would require like taking out like dozens of houses. And um, you know, it just serves something that's like, it's a really an interesting idea to produce like miles and miles away from, from where it's going to be theoretically implemented. And it's kind of produced as this idea of it's like a, it's a concept car. Like we don't actually even expect anyone to, vision, to produce it. We're just gonna kind of make up our idea of what would be cool for these people. Um, so soon into this project, after I'd kind of already agreed to do it, I kind of had this like really creeping sense of dread of like, oh, I'm, I'm really slotted to just kind of produce this horrible nonsense that I, I really don't want to be part of. Um, and so it was a really, in a certain way, like at the beginning of the project it was a real low point for me uh, <laughs> in my, my career. It's like, what, is, what am I doing? Um, how can I sort of make, make this right? So I tried to kind of come up with some principles of how would, we, how would I move forward in this situation in a way that I felt like I could live with. And one of the things I kind of came up with is like the idea of no more fiction. Like I didn't want to produce anything that was about what, what Watts or Willowbrook might become in the future at some other point. I wanted to produce something that was about what it was at that time. And because this is partly because I spent a lot of time in those early days just spending time biking around the community and realizing that it was actually a pretty, you know, there's a lot of really pleasant and wonderful things about, about Willowbrook. There wasn't, it wasn't a place that you had to think of as like a, a nest of, of, of gun trouble and, um, and gang violence. Um, some of the things that are unique about Willowbrook is it has these really, really deep lots, so it has this kind of quasi-rural capacity and people have chickens and horses and things like that. There's like all this kind of rural life going on and it's sort of, in some ways, it's incredibly bucolic there. And so the thought was like, maybe this visioning instead of trying to make a vision of what this place should be, I should just try to make some sort of tool that helps the city or the county see this place for what it is right now. So that was sort of the first principle. And the second was, given that I'm just like a, an artist being placed in this, in this location, I wanna produce something that I think I can honestly say the people in Willowbrook enjoyed and were glad happened, even if there's no further implementation of anything, because you know, it's sort of beyond my control to direct any sort of county, county money. Um, so what I ended up kind of producing um, was essentially just a home and garden tour. Um, and I came to this idea after many different iterations. I kind of built this billboard with my phone number, tried to communicate with people through that, didn't work at all. I produced these zines, um, modeled really specifically almost like as a cover of a Stephen Willits project that he did in East London in the 70s. Being mean, like, what if I just did that same project here? It was sort of interesting, not that interesting, abandoned it. 
uh, eventually hit on this idea of producing a home and garden tour, which is something that happens quite frequently in Los Angeles. Like well-to-do neighborhoods take a lot of pride in their gardens and their homes, and they're organized by county supervisors. Um, but the county supervisor had never thought to organize one in this neighborhood. And so I, I pitched it to them, and they said, oh, yeah, that's actually kind of interesting. We, you know, it's never occurred to us that anyone would have a nice house or garden or a vehicle there. So I kind of used that as the kind of the primary organizing conceit um, to start... Um, start meeting people and finding a way to kind of produce an image of Willowbrook that countervailed the existing, the existing image. And what I found was, was really, really wonderful. So, you know, things like this, like people, you know, this is a couple, the, the man had this kind of amazing uh, exotic turtle collection, the woman had this amazing exotic cactus collection, they found each other, they got married, and they had this amazing backyard <laughs> filled with, um, turtles and cactuses. Um, this is a fountain that uh, a guy who's a self-taught stonemason built out of rubble from the construction of the 105 freeway. Um, just a lot of people just have like really amazing personal senses of style and kind of built their homes into these kind of beautiful palaces. Um, this is uh, an artist uh, who has an amazing sculpture practice but also owns the world's largest collection of super soakers, which um, <laughs> The super soaker was invented by a black aerospace engineer from a neighboring, neighboring neighborhood, so it has kind of a personal connection as well. Um, this is an all-volunteer dog training club that's run by retired truck drivers. So they have this big lot that they own, and people just bring their dogs there and kind of run them around this track on the weekends. Um, this is actually really well known now. This is a Centennial High School's marching band that is like um, kind of deeply connected now through, um, uh, through the music of uh, Kendrick Lamar. A lot of people know about it, but it's kind of an amazing uh, institution. It's like the person who leads it, it was, used to be an arranger for Barry White, and they travel all around the country. Um, they have these kind of amazing kind of local parade traditions, um, quilting clubs, car clubs. The guy on the right, his father was a mechanic on for Herbie the Love Bug, and so they have this massive collection of beetles. Um, there's uh, an aviation club and a horse riding academy, um, and this is a guy who runs horse and carriage out of his like backyard. He just runs a horse and carriage business and takes kids around and prom. So these are sort of these things that were, they're not like necessarily like clearly like, oh, it's, it's like this idyllic world, um, but it's a really weird and interesting and uh, textured world. And I think that was sort of the hope is that kind of actually spending time there enough to really meet enough people, you could bring those stories up to the forefront and kind of produce that into um, both a day long event um, and a publication that we made 1,000 copies of it, or 2,000 copies of it. Half of it went to the Willowbrook uh, Library System as a fundraiser. The other half, it's in its second printing now, um, went to the county. So anyone who's assigned to work in Willowbrook is given a copy of this as sort of an orientation manual for the county. Um, they've now reproduced this project. So there's um, five more of these kinds of books for five other neighborhoods um, in LA County. And it's sort of become sort of a new way for the county to think about how to understand a place um, besides just sort of giving people a brief um, with a bunch of statistics and figures. And the idea here, again, like the point of all this, the point of the storytelling and the point of making something that is bilingual and has a lot of different kind of access points is the idea that if, if you can kind of disrupt someone's expectation of what they will see, hopefully it won't be that they see just this when they go there, but their minds are kind of fragmented enough that they might see something else completely and have, have, have a genuine kind of real engagement with, with that neighborhood where they're assigned to work and be. So this kind of idea I've sort of carried forward in a few other projects that I'll show. Um, this is a project called Takachizu. It's a sort of a neologism, um, of Takara and Chizu, a treasure map. Um, and I've been producing this with a community uh, called Little Tokyo. It's in Los Angeles, sort of in downtown Los Angeles. And it was essentially an exhibition space that opened with nothing in it. Um, and we asked people to come and bring in objects to, the, to them in some way kind of represented what was meaningful and special about the social ties in their neighborhood. Um, and then we, would, we built a light table and documentation setup. And then we'd hold kind of town halls and have conversations about each of these objects and sort of use that as a way to surface issues. Um, it's produced for a community development corporation, so it's a kind of like their ground, grounding um, for further actual development work of figuring out what do we actually need to do to preserve this neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that's in some ways kind of deeply under, under threat because um, 
there's a lot of development in downtown all around it. And so the idea is, okay, well, we know this development is gonna happen, but how can we kind of maintain this as a sort of spiritual or cultural place, cultural home for people who live in Little Tokyo? Um, and so slowly over the course of about a year, we filled like a whole warehouse with these, um, with these documentations and people then went through and kind of uh, took down and noted the ones that were of particular, uh, particular interest or they had questions about and we sort of used it continually as an engagement tool throughout a whole planning process. Um, the last project I want to sort of show to kind of underscore this idea of how kind of a story about a place can have like a very different impact than a planning process. Um, is this kind of two projects that are sort of different sides of a coin? Um, so I do a lot of work in Skid Row, which is adjacent to Little Tokyo, and is, um, as you, you know, probably can guess from the name, um, is a place that's sort of deeply associated with homelessness uh, in Los Angeles. And so when people come to Los Angeles, they often have this vision of like of Skid Row, is like they just see. Um, people living in tents and think like, this is like, this is like uh, hell on earth, I think is something that elected officials would, would just toss off without a, <laughs> a, second, a second thought. Um, so there's a lot of rezoning happening throughout Los Angeles and in particular in the downtown corridor of Los Angeles and just blocks from where Skid Row is, it's sort of a development boom. And so the thought is that there's a lot of development that's moving through Skid Row and the rezoning is kind of focused mostly on sort of getting this problem out of the way so that development can happen. There is also sort of this um, well-publicized, well-known, and deeply tragic uh, crisis of housing throughout, uh, throughout LA. Um, but that's not necessarily the angle in which the planning process has approached <laughs> this area. Um, the idea is sort of like, oh, this is a derelict area, why don't we just get rid of it? Um, and like maybe the homeless people will just, you know, who knows, like they'll just be gone, so it's not a problem anymore. And that seems to be the main brush. So what I worked with, um, had the privilege of working with Teresa Huang, um, an advocacy planner and architect uh, on this project, our Skid Row. It was a multi-year process of trying to figure out what would Skid Row look like um, if you asked people who actually lived in Skid Row um, what they wanted to see there. Um, so we did a lot, of, a lot of workshops. She organized a, a really amazing outreach process that I won't even get into. And we produced this kind of, this, this plan that involves sort of large scale changes we wanted to see and also very specific street scale um, improvements, you know, how can you kind of build things like storage or showers or places to plug in your phone or places that give you some sort of temporary uh, sun shelter, things like that into the street, streetscape so you create like a hab habitable hospital um, environment instead of something that's sort of basically designed to punish and, uh, and extract, extract the residents. Um, so we produced this whole project, city planning kind of nod their heads through the whole thing saying, yeah, that's great, you know, cool. Um, put that on our desk, you know. <laughs> and it, there wasn't necessarily a lot of traction um, in the sense that we thought that this was gonna change anything about the way that the city in, engaged with, um, with Skid Row. Um, a little later, I hooked up with another group called the Los Angeles Poverty Department that's a theater group. And I produced this, which is um, called The Back Nine. And it was an exhibition, like a mini golf course that explained the history of Skid Row through zoning um, and had all uh, kind of nine different holes. And it was also the set to a, um, to a play that LAPD, it's a, it's a Skid Row based um, theater group essentially. It's been running for almost 30 years um, and it's uh, actors kind of, and writers from Skid Row produce the, th the theater collaboratively. And so they produce this, this show and somehow through this combination of, um, of work, it got like a lot of local press and then suddenly, um, suddenly city planning was really interested in talking to us about our, our Skid Row plan. <laughs> and it really changed the whole dynamic of that conversation um, because there was this kind of like shiny media object and it's really the kind of thing where years before we actually even built anything, you know, we got the grant to make this mini golf course about Skid Row and zoning and just that was like for some reason just like a huge media hook and people wanted to write about it without even ever having, you know, set foot in or talk to us. So they just got enough press that suddenly it created this, this pressure on the city to like take this idea seriously, that people in Skid Row have ideas of how they want that, that environment to be. And so now that process has, has really changed and Skid Row has gotten a lot of real changes in the way that this plan that's not ratified yet is moving through city council now. Um, so that's a, an idea of how story can kind of like supplement a kind of planning process to change a dynamic. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Damon Rich, who will close it out. Um, how are people doing? Still doing all right? 
Okay. Um, so uh, the second project I'd like to share a little bit about straddles the time uh, from where I am now, uh, which is working with my partner Jay Shin at the urban design and planning firm called Hector, and where I was for seven years before that um, in the municipal planning office of Newark, New Jersey. Has anyone here had the pleasure, maybe, of working with or interacting with a municipal planning office? Oh, yeah, one smiling person, a happy customer. Um, you know, if, if you haven't, it's basically the place where if you want to build something in a city, you have to bring your drawings, and then people who either support it or object to it can come and look at your drawings, and then there's a public meeting, and you can all work it out. Um, so just like the, the garbage problems project that I shared before, which would not have been possible unless some popular educators had kind of come and helped me in my uh, design confusion, um, the project I'd, I'd like to talk about now really owes a great debt to the American tradition of community organizing. So whether you've come across people like Ella Baker, um, like, uh, like Saul Olinsky, um, you know, this is really a tradition that for me at least as a designer um, has taught me a lot about how to think in terms of other people's self-interest, how to design in a way that puts coalition, build, coalition building at the center of the work, how to focus on concrete wins while recognizing the long haul, and as much as possible, making every step in the process an opportunity for community building and learning, um, which I think of as design for organizing. So, um, it's a mainstay of design representation and publicity uh, to show the before and the after, right? Where there's a really bad situation and then luckily some awesome designers show up and kind of sprinkle and do their magic and then it's completely transformed through the force of, of their concepts. Um, for me, this really leaves out, I think, the most important and valuable things for design for organizing, um, which happen either before the design project, happen in between the before and after, or probably most importantly happens after we as the designers leave the scene. So I'd like to talk about before, after, and beyond. Instead of us as designers or artists kind of possessing this special knowledge or being creatives, and being generous enough to share these goodies with the public, like we're Santa Claus or something. Um, for me, it's always been much more important, and I've learned through difficult experience, to treat it much more like when you show up at the party as the total stranger, and you're just doing your desperate best to relate to anyone, and you're very grateful for anyone who will have any kind of discussion with you. You know, putting that creation of connections and coalitions is the first and foremost important part of design. Um, so this is a series of projects, uh, you know, with many, many people involved um, in a city, an American city, by a river that has many generic but true things about it. Um, the river is the reason that the city is there and went up to the water's edge. Uh, also generic but true, it's been the inheritor of a pretty nasty, toxic legacy. So what you're seeing is a 10-foot thick concrete cap over a site where first they made DDT, those of you who have read Silent Spring, and then after that became illegal, they made Agent Orange for the American War in Vietnam. Third generic but true thing, if you go there, you'd see a lot of what urban planners call underutilized property. And the kind of strange and intriguing looks of the place has made it uh, to have star turns in things like appearing in the opening credit sequence of The Sopranos. Um, but this look was not because of a lack of planning. Uh, in fact, it was because of it. So when I got a job in City Hall, the mayor at the time said, oh, I'd like you to take a look at the riverfront, among other things, and had delivered to my desk six banker boxes of past unrealized plans. The riverfront had really been identified for over 25 years by the city's elite, government and business leaders, as a place where the entire history of the city, they thought, could be changed. Its identity could be replaced with something a lot more productive and rewarding. And if you look at a lot of their actual physical designs, you'll see the marks of this kind of practice of exclusion, right? Around the edge of something like this. The way that public spaces are completely embedded in this new development. And you don't have to talk to many residents of the city to understand that this fits into a much larger system of exclusions, where the Business Improvement District puts up a banner that says, Newark, it's yours to rediscover, like it's a lost island of Atlantis. 
even though this hangs only half a block away from the most populated, the most popping intersection in the most densely populated state in our country, which is New Jersey. And this ties to a story, I don't know about you, but at least I was told a very false story that I believed for a long time, which was that American cities used to be wonderful places full of immigrants from Europe who worked really hard and shopped downtown. And then this goodness was cracked in half as the complexion of residents of these places changed through the Great Migration and other types of immigration. In fact, Newark, where I live, was an icon on the cover of Life magazine when the National Guard occupied the city for two weeks and killed about two dozen people. But then, as this false story goes, all of that kind of was left in the rear view in the 90s, where we had an urban renaissance, and people had big apartments, and hung out at the coffee shop. Um, and so Newarkers feel a certain way when people tell stories about this, partially because it covers over an entire other set of histories where people worked long and hard and deliberated how to build a proud black city, along with the culture and the politics that it would require, a lot of which focused on, lucky for me as someone who does architecture, the built environment. So in trying to figure out something different to do about the riverfront than the history, the first thing that I learned from community organizers was that the public isn't just something that exists out there that has to be tapped into, but has to be produced through the painstaking and slow work of knocking on doors, assembling email lists, and talking to people. What really led us on the path was finding one of those plans that really stuck out, that was created by a neighborhood organization that said, hey, among other things, while you're building all those great high rises, maybe we could get a little bit of park for our crowded neighborhood. And this made it clear that the interests around the riverfront were not monolithic and that there was some action to be had between them. So rather than another billion dollar vision, this kind of connects to Roston when vision is the problem, we decided to come up with about as many ideas as we could, 30 ideas, 40 ideas, to see which of them might have a chance of attracting desire, of attracting enthusiasm and political support. We set a really arbitrary goal of reaching 2% of Newarkers, getting two cents from 2%, about trying to touch 5,000 people to see if any project here was even worth doing. Uh, began doing things that people do in design studios, looking around, making sketches, trying to figure out how, why things are the way they are, looking at the archives, interviewing real estate developers, environmentalists, making maps of things we found, like exciting things like dead birds and like ripped up boxer shorts. Through this, we really discovered a long-term existing movement around environmental justice in the town, oftentimes fighting against things that people didn't want, but oftentimes fighting for positive visions, like a little bit of park along the river. Most recently, we had learned about a group of public housing residents who had fought against the housing authority, their landlord, who had leased land to a company that was in the business of storing these shipping containers. So between their apartments and the river was a seven-story stack of these things. And finally, by getting this article, they shamed their landlord enough to end that lease. So the group of young people started coming up with their own visions then, things like a factory that only produces the smell of chocolate or a roller coaster that goes along the edge of the water. And this is where it became more than just a fun after school program. The mayor had a press conference where he came and cut a little ribbon on this little model of the way we envisioned the riverfront in the year 3000 and started to talk about some of the, the city's ideas for this place. The model was installed outside of where you pay your water bill. So we thought every time some person wandered out over out of boredom to check out this weird looking thing, that was another win for two cents from 2%. Um, as you started to look at this thing, it was kind of meant to unarm you, disarm you a little bit. The TV news, without asking anyone's permission, grabbed the students and took them down to the riverfront and made the whole thing sound like an episode of Scooby-Doo. Around New Jersey, around the clock. This is News 12 New Jersey. Well, you may have heard about a plan to spruce up the Passaic River area in Newark. But the dreaming goes far beyond cleaning up a blighted area. As News 12 New Jersey's Rick Holmes shows us, the new vision could bring hundreds of jobs and even several new building projects to the Brick City. So you started this back in October, you guys? Oh. Yeah. All right, so I got to... I, I'm seeing all this trash out here. You weren't cleaning up the trash? No. <laughs> it was not job. It's a mess out here. The work began with a group of Newark teens who wanted to learn more about their hometown river. Do you have to walk the river? You have to walk the yeah. yeah. You have to walk, yeah, see what was down here, really like get up close and personal with it. 
their work has paid off. Newark City Hall wants to turn the Newark Riverfront into a brand. Those pesky kids. So from there, we were able to get some support to create the first public boat tours, where for $5, you could take your family out for two hours. I got to collaborate with someone who mostly makes flyers for club nights. So I learned a lot about lens flare. <laughs> And these were kind of like floating living rooms where people from all over the city came together and people really noticed, right, when you had been able to cross those lines and who you attracted of race and class and boundaries. Um, there were visual aids so people could share stories. People stood up and said, I remember the day that they came and vacuumed the sidewalk in spacesuits before they covered it with 10 feet of concrete. We also did programs just to reach the affluent where we, where we charged $100 because talking to the people with capital is important too. We went on walk shops to try to understand why it was the way it was, hearing from site environmental remediation um, engineers, from businesses that might have seemed boarded up from the outside. And here's how we did with the numbers. But the numbers were not the point here. The point was to force ourselves to figure out anything we could that had the potential of creating a relationship between people doing things in the city and this place. So the second thing we had to do was to look at the basic laws that made the rules for what you could build and where you could build it. Um, I got this phrase from Rawson, unleash the regulatory imagination. I won't go into the weeds of zoning, but basically someone in the past had said, oh, at some point that whole blue area, that'll be where you do riverfront stuff. And they had left it very vague. And so to try to break down this policy and make policy public, we took all of the many things that zoning could address and just made 24 simple questions. Do we need a new park? What kind of buildings should they be, et cetera? How could the river's edge be connected to the upland? We made this series of workbooks that were designed for use in the smallest granule of civic society, the block club, the neighborhood association, people who meet every month, but might not have huge numbers, but are there kind of holding down the neighborhood. It went through different scenarios, what kind of public investment, et cetera. And this wasn't about choosing your favorite. It was really about talking to people like they're people and understanding the pros and cons of different types of directions. And probably the most exciting thing that came out of it was for the first time ever, a number of these neighborhood block associations came together to write and publish this citywide resident statement on riverfront development. It totally freaked out my boss, the deputy mayor, who thought things were getting out of control. Um, but for me, it really represented a new voice and a new interest on the scene. And in fact, the city council then passed a law that uh, really took care of the one thing that most people cared about, which was the ability to walk down to the riverfront and enjoy it. And out of the 99 property owners, 98 thought that was okay. <laughs> and one of them said, that's against the Constitution. Happy to tell that story later. Um, the third and final thing uh, was to build with roots and organize communities. So after some of those boat rides and other activities, sometimes on a work night, we would have 100 people in City Hall talking about what could the city's first riverfront park look like. I got to collaborate with great landscape architects. Shout out to the landscape architects like Lee Weintraub. Um, and we also decided to try to change the first site. So instead of downtown near the office buildings, it made more sense to put it in the neighborhood that had been organizing around the riverfront for 30 years and try to see if we could get the energy to go out from there. And so a site that looked like this, um, a students came back and made this construction sign about what the spirit of the place might look like. Uh, we were able, uh, in about seven years, to build uh, 15 acres of park, which cost about $25 million. Here it is looking over, to, you can see the golden dome of City Hall, um, the orange boardwalk. You might say, why is it orange? Well, the mayor's favorite tie is orange. You know, there's Agent Orange. Uh, one of the favorite high schools in town is Requaic, which is orange. Princeton is orange. They started in Newark, so on and so forth. Later on, one of the yoga teachers in the Riverfront Park said, oh, someone who did this must have known that the water chakra is orange. <laughs> Other people then started to take the social symbolism for their own, uh, their own agendas. Uh, we tried to make a place that was relaxing and welcoming, uh, crossing again lines in the city, places to chill out, to be with people. It opened up a new way to see the city. You couldn't see the skyline so easily from within the city itself before. And a lot of people who had worked for 25 years, like the Ironbound Community Corporation, the Committee Against Toxic Waste, you know, some really hard-boiled people said, look, we just don't want a nice park where people come to it and say, this is nice, and forget all about the struggle that went into making it. So we want the park to tell its own story. So as designers, and I got to work with graphic designers like Monday through Friday, we started thinking about how these characters and spirits of the place might manifest in its different surfaces. So you come in, you read a poem from Langston 
Jackson Hughes about rivers, one of the first Afrocentric poems in the American tradition, and you read the names of everyone, not just the private donors who put money into this. You go down to the water's edge and along this railing, you see these water jet cut signs that start to tell some of the hidden stories like, what's that concrete platform over there? Well, to understand that, you'll have to understand a little bit about the history of sewers in this place. Like, once upon a time, there were no sewers. And then that caused problems and diseases. So then they built a sewer, which worked pretty good, except when the river became so full of nastiness that you couldn't open your window at night. So then they built a sewage treatment plant, which worked pretty good to take some of the nastiness out of the river, except when it rained and the whole thing overflowed and created a real mess. And so here's how some people are trying to deal with that current problem of the technology. And this tells stories of industrial archaeology, uh, about the fish and the birds you might see, like this crab that says, do not catch me or eat me. I am poisonous. And these become places where kids come and do rubbings and kind of share these stories and pass them along. Sometimes people take the power in their own hands and create their own stories in three languages, which was impressive. This was a protest against a proposed electrical plant. As a protest to Archigram, I don't know if there's any Archigram fans of this thing called the log plug uh, from back in the day, we created these narrative logs that carry additional stories like the uh, contamination uh, in the ground that was created by a smelting plant that had occupied the site for about 100 years. And we found all kinds of stories like when the whole thing exploded and horses went up 30 feet in the air and landed on their feet without being harmed, or people caught on fire and had to run in the river. Kids, little kids seemed to really like those. Uh, the hardest ones to make were the ones that were living memories. So this at the bottom here is a protest movement that preserved a neighborhood park from becoming a minor league baseball stadium. And we felt so proud of ourselves for platforming this story and we'd bring it to the people involved and they'd be like, my hairstyle was nothing like that in 1986. So we had to redraw it and take it back. Um, and again, these come places where all kinds of stories manifest on the walls. Uh, the geographic location of the place. And then finally, there's the parties, maybe the most important thing. Every time a new part of the park opens, we have an event called Newark Walks to the Water, led by a different marching band, the Malcolm X Shabazz Marching Band, part of Newark's radical tradition as a proud black city. And this becomes a place where all the people who do cool things all around the city at least once a year to come together in this place to share what they do. People bring their own typefaces. <laughs> <laughs> to the design, which I think is interesting. Um, people use the first public boat dock in 100 years, and we tried to find anything that anyone was interested in doing, having a gospel festival, having a discussion about contamination, uh, having house music parties uh, in the night, and having first baptisms in the morning to connect the life of the community to this design place. This also held for bringing institutions together who aren't always friends. Um, so, for example, the most recent thing that we were able to do was this piece of outreach material for the uh, organization called Newark Riverfront Revival that explains some of the real mechanics around building parks, around environmental systems, and tries to take this kind of classic view of the city where you always see Manhattan there in the background, that kind of claim to legitimacy, um, although it hides the riverfront and spins it around 180 degrees to reveal all of the complexity and spirit and fierce pride um, along that water's edge. Um, and just in case you think that, oh, this is pretty before and after-ish, I really want to share with you some of the asterisks. Like, the day the park opened up after 30 years of struggle, the headlines were, finally, Riverfront Park and Newark, unfriendliest city in the world. Sorry, Islamabad, you're number two. Um, also, during construction, we had Hurricane Sandy, which didn't cause too much damage, but really changed people's calculus about riverfront and habitation, including leading to all kinds of bad Army Corps ideas. And so, and then finally, uh, we have um, some friends in public housing fighting against, uh, two years after the park opened up, um, their landlord saying that they would like to demolish their homes and redevelop them. So I think the only hope in these kinds of situations to keep on struggling is that your design becomes part of this larger world. So you can see those orange sticks fading into a broader landscape, and you invite the right people at the party to keep the struggle going. Thank you so much, Damon, Broston, Althea. Let's give them a warm thank you.
So um, we had planned to have a Q and A, but in fact out of time at this point. Um, there is a lovely reception that's going to be outside and I know our speakers will be there. So please save your questions and ask them outside. I'm sorry to, to call time. I do want to make a shout out to have us think about Aggie Square in relation to this. Oak Park, the community's there, what UC Davis is doing. I think this is an amazing vision for community activism and organization uh, in the midst of change such as what's, what's potentially happening there. Uh, it's, it's a local issue of UC Davis in Sacramento. Um, so thank you again for bringing us your, your wisdom, your vision, your experiences, and we look forward to talking with you further. So. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.